Good afternoon. Right, so what we're going to talk about now is parallel universe of the vector API. But this talk's actually going to be a bit more than that. Um, the first part, I really want to kind of talk a bit more about how we think we can improve the performance of applications by using concurrency and parallelism and also understanding what is the difference between concurrency and parallelism. So first thing, what we often find is the idea that if we break a task up into subtasks and then do them at the same time, there's a general kind of feeling that we can do things faster and we can do things more efficiently. But that's not always the case. And we can take a simple example. So let's say that we, we have a situation where one person can build a wall in 60 minutes. OK, that's fine. So if you apply two people to that task and you have them work together in parallel, then you would realistically think that they could get the task done in 30 minutes. And that's probably quite achievable. OK. So why don't we take it to the next level and say, let's apply four people to this task, trying to build a wall, four people. You might, might just be able to get them to do it in 15 minutes because you can probably think about dividing up the work and getting them to do that in 15 minutes. But if you kind of take it to its logical extreme, okay, it's not working. Let's say we apply 360 people to the task of building a wall, could we do it in 10 seconds? Well, no, of course we can't, can we? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, logically, that if you try and get 360 people all to build a wall at the same time, you're not going to be able to do it in 10 seconds. If anything, it's going to take you way longer than an hour to do that. So this is what I mean by we have to think carefully about how we use concurrency and parallelism if we want to get better results. The other thing you've got to think about is what's called Amdahl's Law. And if you've heard of Amdahl's Law, Amdahl's Law is, talks about the improvement in performance you can get when you have certain parts of a task that can be done in parallel and certain tasks that can't be done in parallel. So it's worth having a look at that uh, to decide whether that makes sense. OK, so now let's talk about concurrent and parallel. And what is the difference? And I think this is one of those things that actually makes a really good interview question. You know, you've got somebody who's, you know, applied for a job, ask them what's the difference between concurrency and parallelism. So concurrency. Concurrency is where we have two or more tasks, has to be at least two, that start, run, and complete in overlapping time periods. Okay? But, most importantly, there is no guarantee they will ever be running at the same time. Now, if you think about it, if you go back in computing history and you go back to the days when we had single core, single processor machines, I, I know it's hard to remember that far back, but there were days when we had single core, single processor machines. Now, we had operating systems that made it look like you could actually do more than one thing at the same time. But obviously, with only one execution engine, that isn't, strictly speaking, possible. So the, the trick that we used was time sharing. We'd have different threads running, different processes running, and we'd time share between those. So we'd let one process run for a while, then we'd, we'd preempt it, we'd switch to another process, let that run for a while, preempt it, and so on. And if we did that quick enough, you get the illusion that the tasks are running at the same time. But in concurrency, that will work because you can do more than one thing, but you don't actually have them necessarily running at the same time. And if we put that into a diagram, we can see something like this. So we've got task one that starts, task two starts at some point as well, and then they overlap in terms of time, but sometimes they are running together Sometimes they're not running together. So it's important to get that. The really kind of key thing here is that task two 
for it to be concurrent, task two must start before task one ends. So it doesn't matter where they end, but task two must start before task one ends. That's it. So that's concurrency, where we can have more than one task running at the same time, but not necessarily in parallel. So then that brings us to parallelism. So parallelism is where we can have two or more tasks that actually run at the same time. And that's a guarantee. And if we use the same diagram, what we now get is those two tasks running at the same time. So they're actually running in parallel. So as I say, that's quite an important thing to get across, as we'll see a little bit later on. Now we can have high-level concurrency. We can think of you know, separate machines as being a level of concurrency. Multiple people all using applications at the same time. So two people doing word processing and doing it at the same time. So there's a level of concurrency going on there. There's overlap in terms of the time. Then we can take that down to a low level. And we can say, talk about machine level concurrency. That's where we see this idea of an operating system that does time sharing. We have preemption. We have quanta of time associated with different tasks and so on. So we can switch between things very quickly and give the illusion of processes running at the same time. But then, of course, with more modern machines, we can switch to the idea of having multiple CPUs, which introduces the idea that we can have both concurrency and parallelism at the same time, because we can do things concurrently and I can't spell concurrency, can I? Um, concurrency and parallelism at the same time. And then we can obviously take that down to the processor level, and we can look at the idea of cores within the processor. A single core allows us to do concurrency but not parallelism. Once we get to dual core or quad core or beyond, then yes, we can have both concurrency and parallelism at the same time. Now, one of the benefits of doing concurrency and parallelism at this level, certainly parallelism, is that you can have shared memory. So you have the cache that's shared between the cores. That gives you very fast access to data and it makes it a lot more efficient in terms of being able to do those things at the same time. Right, so let's talk a little bit about concurrency programming in Java, since really that's what we're here to talk about. Now, if we look at concurrent programming in Java, there have been a lot of things about that. First of those is that Java, right from the very beginning, had the idea of concurrent programming built into it. And that was different, really, to languages like C and C++. Yes, you could do concurrent programming in C and C++, but you really needed separate libraries to do that. In Java, right from the very beginning, it had that concept built in. And we did that really using two things, the thread class and the runnable interface. Thread class allowed you to create a thread of execution you could provide a method or you could provide a runnable object, and whatever was included in that method could be executed in that thread, and that could happen concurrently or in parallel, depending on what was available underneath. But from a programming point of view, it was easy for you as a developer to simply say, I want to create a separate thread of execution, and we can do that with a thread and a runnable interface. One very important thing to remember about that, though, is we mustn't assume that if by doing things concurrently, we will do things faster or even more efficiently. And so this kind of comes back to my example at the beginning where if you think about building a wall, yes, if you have two people or maybe four people doing it at the same time, that will work more efficiently, that will be faster. But if you start throwing 360 people at building a wall all at the same time, it's not going to be as efficient, and it's not going to be faster. And exactly the same thing applies when it comes to concurrent programming in Java, or concurrent programming in general. Now, in terms of how we take concurrent programming and make it a practical solution, there's more to it than simply saying, right, let's create a thread, have something executed in that thread, and off it goes. Most of the time, what you're going to end up with is threads that need to cooperate, threads that need to share state. 
They need to share values and do it in a way that's safe. Because, of course, if you've got things happening at the same time, then you've got a shared variable. One thread updates that variable. Another thread comes along and updates it as well. If you don't have control over that, you can have inconsistent changes. Changes get lost. It's the, the classic example of you know, a, an account where you've got um, updates which say, we want to add a certain amount to that um, account. And if another thread comes in while you're doing that update, you end up with the wrong number and everything doesn't work. So we need a way of having cooperating threads. From the very beginning, we had threads and we had Runnable. And to build on that, you had certain very primitive constructs. So thread, for example, had four things in it. It had um, see, um, sleep, wait, interrupt, and notify. And that allowed you to coordinate the way that those threads worked. We also had the idea of a lock. So you could have synchronized blocks of code, synchronized methods, and a single monitor associated with an object. Trying to write cooperating thread code with just those primitives is very, very difficult to make it reliable. It's, it's you know, really incredibly hard to do that. To get around that, in Java C5, we introduced the concurrency utilities. So this was JSR 166, if you remember back to those days. What that did was introduce a lot more sort of library code that gave you higher level primitives in order to have cooperating code. Things like semaphores, things like mutexes, things like read-write locks. All of those were included. And that gave you a, a bigger tool set, if you like, that made it simpler to write cooperating multi-threaded code. So that was a, a real sort of move forward in terms of how Java allowed you to write that kind of code. Obviously, we then continue with that. And so Java SE 6 added a few more libraries. But then in JDK 7, we got the idea of the fork join framework as a, a different approach to the same problem, which is that we want to take a single task, break it up into smaller subtasks, and have those execute concurrently or in parallel. And if you look at the way that the fork join frame works, works, what you end up with is taking your set of data and then dividing it into two. And you do that recursively using a method that you define until you get to a small enough unit of execution that you can apply to a single thread. Once you've done that, all of the results are generated and they're all brought back together at the end so you get the ultimate result of the work that you actually want to achieve. The great thing about the framework is that a lot of that sort of boilerplate code and a lot of the hard work is dealt with by the framework. And you really just have to provide the method that says how to break things up, the test that says have we got a small enough execution unit, and then generate the results. So it all kind of works a lot more easily. So for those kinds of tasks where you're breaking things up into smaller units, this is a very powerful feature to use. And it's, it's been used in several ways later on, as we'll see. Then we got JDK 8. And JDK 8 introduced the idea of streams and lambdas. So we had a more functional style of programming in Java, which again, is great. The wonderful thing here is that the library hides a lot of the complexity of how concurrency works from you, the user, or the programmer. But you have to be careful again here, because you can get non-deterministic results. What do I mean by that? Well, if I've got a list of strings, and I get those from somewhere, so a bunch of words, what I can do is I can use the streams API, and I can say words dot create me a stream, and that's a sequential stream of the words in that list. So we'll say, take the same order of the, the words in the list, pass them into our map function, which will map them to uppercase, and then collect those into another list. Now, I know that because of the way that this works, the sequential stream will guarantee that the order of the list that I have at the beginning is going to be the same as the order of the list that I have when I generate my results. Great. But what I can do with the streams is create a parallel stream, 
which is actually a really bad name. And I tweeted about this this morning because I was thinking about it, and I thought, that's, that's a very bad name because there's no guarantee that a parallel stream will actually execute at the same time. It should really be called a concurrent stream. Um, I wait and see whether anybody from Oracle actually replies to my tweet on that one to see whether there's a, a reason why they think that it should be called that. But anyway, we can create a parallel stream which divides up the set of uh, words that we get in our stream into a number of uh, concurrent streams and then process those individually using different threads. In fact, this uses the fork join framework underneath, so it's another good use of that. We can then pass each of those to map to map to upper, and then we can bring those together in terms of generating a new list. Obviously, from our point of view, we don't have to worry about doing all of the boilerplate code for the fork join framework. We don't have to do any of that kind of complexity. All we know is that we take our values, create a parallel stream. Ideally, that's going to happen more, uh, happen more quickly, and so we'll end up with our results um, more quickly as well. But because we've got no idea of how those threads are going to work, we don't know that the order of the list that's created at the end is going to be the same as the order of the list that we start with, or if we run that several times, we won't necessarily get the same results in terms of the order of that list because the threads could behave differently as the machine works. So it, it can lead, well, most likely will lead to non-deterministic results. Now, the other thing you need to think about when you're doing something like that is that some operations are very good in terms of breaking them up into parallel streams, and some are not. So some operations will decompose nicely into, into concurrent operations. Things like sum, minimum, and maximum are good. The reason for that is because if you think about creating a total of all the values you've got in your stream, there's no interdependency between the values that you're processing. You can separate out the, let's say you've got 100 values, you could separate them out into groups of 10 and then have a summation of each group of 10. And you can do that independently. There's no difficulty with having to rely on the results from other uh, pieces of the computation until you get to the end result. So you could do them independently as 10 different threads, generate a result for each of those, and then add those results together and get your result more quickly. Great. Same thing applies to minimum and maximum. You can do the minimum of 10 results, then take the minimum of each group of 10 and generate the minimum of that, and that will still give you the minimum of all of the 100 initial elements. Same for maximum. However, if you look at some operations like sort, that doesn't lend itself well to doing things concurrently. Because if you say, right, let's divide our 100 elements into groups of 10, if we sort each of those groups of 10, there's no guarantee that when you try and take those 10 groups that you've got, that the order will now be correct because you could have all sorts of different values in different groups. Now, yes, there are things like merge sort as an algorithm, which is much more better in terms of its design for that kind of approach. But you need to think that sort is not going to be the sort of thing that will get the same level of improvement by doing it concurrently versus things like sum, min, and max. The other thing you've got to be careful with parallel streams is, is don't use them for things um, that can't be easily split or that perform I.O. So if you're doing something like reading lines from a file, again, that's not going to be very good if you try and use a parallel stream for it because you've got a single entry into the, the file and you're reading it sequentially trying to take sequential things and then pass it into parallel things. Um, again, you know, there are various techniques you can use to try and improve that. You could potentially have multiple points into the same file, or you could try and read the file quickly and then break it up into blocks. But it doesn't really lend itself well to using a parallel stream and getting better results. Now, concurrent programming can use multiple execution units, as I said, CPU cores, and can possibly improve the performance, but it doesn't necessarily require them or guarantee improved performance. Now, the one last thing I'll talk about is um, virtual threads, because this was something that was introduced in uh, JDK, well, became a full feature in JDK 21. So it's worth just mentioning these, because 
people have been um, very keen on the idea of virtual threads, and they think, yes, this is great. We need to use virtual threads. So the idea behind virtual threads is that rather than each Java thread mapping to an individual operating system level thread, which has its limitations in terms of scalability, what we've done now is to say, let's have multiple Java threads map to a single application thread, operating system level thread, or is what we call a platform thread. And this allows us to reduce the, the number of operating system threads that we need, and we can then scale up to a much larger number of Java threads without having to scale up the hardware that we're using underneath. Now, this can deliver significantly greater scalability. We've seen great examples of this where things like web servers, you can scale up to a much higher number of users than you can by using one thread per Java thread, uh, operating system level per Java thread. But virtual threads are not about performance. They're about scalability. How can we deliver more potential connections to our application server or our web server, but not necessarily do things faster? Because all we're doing is sharing the same platform thread amongst a group of Java threads. But we also need to be very careful about these, because we can end up with worse performance. Virtual threads are very much suited to what's called a thread per request programming model. And that's you know, web servers, application servers, where you've got clients using a, a web browser, for example. They come in with a connection. They're independent from lots of other users who are also coming in and creating a connection. So in that case, we have one thread per request from the clients. And that works very well, so long as each of those threads spend most of their time asleep. So they, they go off and they do I.O., whether it's data, ac accessing a database, whether it's uh, reading a file, or making a network connection, whatever. But what you really want is a situation where your application threads are going to spend most of their time blocked on some kind of activity, which means that they can give up that operating system level thread, and another Java thread can make use of it. So as long as that happens, and we frequently go to sleep and allow the or block so we can release that thread and allow it to be used by another Java thread, things will work very well. If your thread is CPU intensive, it's going to hold that thread for as long as it wants um, because there's no preemption in terms of the way virtual threads work. So the, the Java virtual machine will not go, oh, this, this thread's been holding that platform thread for a long time. Let's stop it and give somebody else a chance. That doesn't happen. And the same thing with locks, in fact. So if you put a lock around something and then e you even then you do some kind of I.O., because you've got a lock around it, it's um, not going to release the thread. So you need to be very careful about how you use that in those types of situations. OK, so now let's get into the sort of vector side of things and this new API that's being created. But before we do that, we'll have a little bit of background on vectors and single instruction multiple data. So single instruction multiple data is where we have true parallel processing in that we are doing more than one thing guaranteed at the same time. And the way that we do this is by using a very wide register in the processor. Obviously, nowadays, we have 64-bit processors most of the time. But what we're going to use is some, something like 128-bit, 256-bit, 512-bit. In some cases, extreme cases, you know, we could have 2,048 bits in a register. And by doing that, what we can do is we can put multiple values into that register and have them processed in a single clock cycle. So it's true parallelism, because as one clock cycle happens, multiple elements all processed at the same time. And these registers, because they hold lots of different values, the number of values that they hold, that's what we call the number of lanes in that register. So if we take some values and we perform a simple iteration to process them, let's say we want to add two to each of these values. Using a simple iteration, what we're going to do is obviously we'll take the first element, we'll add two, generate a result. Take the second element, generate result. Take the third element, generate result. Take the fourth element, generate result. 
So that takes a number of clock cycles because we have to do each of those things sequentially. If we take single instruction multiple data, what we're going to do is take our very wide register, load it up with elements from our array. So in this case, we've got four elements. Put all of them into that register, and then apply the same operation to each of them in a single clock cycle. So we know that we're adding two to each of those. So this is quite important because it means that the instructions that the processor uses has to understand that we have a number of lanes in that register so that it can apply the same operation to that. It's not like just treating it as a very long sequence of bits and saying, let's add two to that whole sequence of bits. It's dividing up into those lanes and adding two to each of those lanes in there. So it requires the processor to understand and be designed to deal with this kind of thing. Now, okay, <laughs> this goes back a long way, and we, we've used this for a long time. And so I, I sort of found some pictures of, of early machines that used single instruction multiple data. Anybody here recognize this machine? Probably not, because this is 1966, so that's going back quite a long way. Um, nearly 60 years. This is an ILIAC 4. And then I found a couple of other ones. There's the uh, CDC Star 100 and the Texas Instruments ASC. I love computers like this because they, they take up a whole room for one computer. And of course, you'll actually have less computing power in that entire room than you have in your mobile phone. So it's good to see how things have improved over there. And then, of course, we have to have uh, one of my favorite computers, the Cray One. The reason I, I really like this one is because it has a, a sofa that's built around the computer. So that's real computing, having a sofa that was part of the computer. Right. And then, obviously, from a processor point of view, there's also a history associated with that. Uh, I won't spend too long on this, but essentially, you know, you can go back to the 1990s, which is where the um, commodity chip manufacturers started to include this functionality into their processors. So back in 1994, HP had the PA risk, if you're old enough to remember that had max instructions, which had 32-bit and 64-bit registers. Not very wide, but you know, wide-ish in those days. 1995, good old Sun Microsystems, who I used to work for. Um, they had the UltraSpark processor with the VIS instructions. Then Intel got into the game with the Pentium P5, introducing the multimedia extensions, 64-bit uh, registers there. Then they had the Intel Pentium 3, which had the streaming SIMD instructions, 128-bit registers. Then in 2011, they switched to the AVX instructions, which were 128-bit wide registers. AVX 2 came in 2013, 256-bit wide registers, and AVX 512, which is the kind of current big one, is, um, came in 2016. OK, so the Vector API is all about how we can use the vectors in the processor. And the Vector API holds the record at the moment as being the longest incubating API in Java history. It's currently at its seventh iteration. And if you look at JDK 23, it's going into its eighth uh, incubator iteration. Now, there's good reason for that. It's not really that the, the API itself is, is evolving very, um, it has a lot of changes happening to it. It's more to do with the fact that um, the designers have, have quite rightly said that they're actually waiting for another thing called Project Valhalla to be included in Java, because this is sort of related to the Project Valhalla um, technologies. So once parts of Valhalla are delivered, then the Vector API will become final. But there's, there's not really a lot of changes happening, even when we're in the seventh incubator. So how do we represent vectors in the Java API? Well, let's assume that we're using ABX2 instructions. We've got um, a 256-bit wide register. We have a very imaginatively named vector class. And it's a, um, one that has a uh, type parameter associated with generic type parameter associated with it, type E. Not to be confused with the vector collections class that we had from JDK, actually, I think it was JDK 1.0 we actually had vector from. So it's the vector for registers, not vector for collections. So it has generic type parameter E. 
Now, if you look at the, the methods that you get in the vector class, what you have are all the sort of common methods that you would expect that apply to all different types of vector. So addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, min, max, things like that. What we then do, it, because vector is an abstract class, we then have concrete classes, subtypes, that represent all the numerical primitive types that we have in Java. So we've got a byte, short, int, long, float, and double vector. And those add some additional methods which are type-specific. Because if you want to create a vector from an array of values, then you're going to need a type-specific method that takes the appropriate uh, primitive type array in order to populate the vector. So going back to our diagram, we've got our vector of type E, and then we will use a type-specific vector, which in this case we'll use an int vector, which can hold a number of ints. Because ints are 32-bit wide, and we've got 256 bits in our register, we know that we can store eight ints in that vector. And as I said, these are what we call lanes. So we've got eight lanes in the vector. Now what we then get is confused. We get confused because they decided to call the next class that we use a vector shape, which is wrong. It's not a vector shape. A shape is something that has vertices, it has edges, it has angles associated with it. What we're dealing with here is a size. So why did they not call it vector size? I mean, that would be very logical, wouldn't it? Because it's actually the size of the vector in terms of the number of bits. That's not a shape, it's a size. But anyway, so we have a vector shape. And in this case, it's 256 bits. Because we can't start a, a variable name in Java with a number, we have to have s underscore 256 underscore bit to represent that. And then obviously there are different shapes or sizes that are associated with different registers. So we've got a 64, 128, 256, and a 512 bit value that we can use for a vector shape. And then we also have one which is S max bit. And again, I take issue with this. Why did they use lowercase for max and not uppercase? Because bit is uppercase. So why not be consistent? These things worry me. These things trouble me. But anyway. So when we, we talk about the maximum number of bits, even though it it's, you know, uses the wrong case in, in the definition, what you can do with that is you can use it to represent the largest size vector that you have in the machine you're currently running on. The advantage of this is obviously it makes it more portable. Some machines will have a 128-bit register. Some machines will have a 256. Some machines will have a 512. If you use S max bit, you can then make it platform neutral, and it will simply say, right, the size of your biggest ve vector is 256 or 512 or whatever. Now, interestingly, Intel processors can support more than one shape, size, um, whereas ARM processors can support only one shape, and it's really tied to the implementation of the ARM architecture. So whether you're using a Snapdragon processor or one of the Apple processors, that will determine what the size of the um, what the size of the vector is that you can use. So, if you're running on an ARM processor, always a good idea to use the S max bit because that can be anywhere from 128 to, as I said, 2,048 bits, depending on which processor you're using. Then we have a vector species. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll go with species. That's a good name. Um, and what that represents is a combination of the element type and the shape of the vector. So it's a way of saying, right, we will have our vector, and we've got certain things associated with it. So in this case, a species is going to have a type, int. It's going to have the length of the uh, vector in terms of the number of lanes, so eight. And it's going to have the number of bits, which is the, the shape, so it'll be 256 bits. Now, obviously, if you know two of those things, you can calculate the third. So if you know that you're storing ints in it and it's 256 bits wide, then you could determine eight from that, but it's just easier to encapsulate everything into a single um, piece of information. So how do we use this? Okay, so what we can do is we can, we can say, right, 
let's take the code that we want to write in terms of numerical processing and use vectors to actually do that work. So here what I'm doing is I'm saying, right, let's take a vector species of type integer, and we'll, we'll have the int species, and we'll take it a species 256 bit. So that, that means that we've got a 256 bit wide register that we're going to store ints in, great. And then we'll create some arrays of ints, a million long. What we then need to do is figure out if we want to loop through that and process each of them, we need to create a loop that is going to um, use the right striding. So it's going to move forward by the right number of elements in that array for each time we populate the vector. So we need to move forward by the number of lanes, which in this case will be eight. So we can find that from the species. Again, we're writing platform neutral code. We don't have to tie ourselves to a specific architecture. So we know that we can move forward by however many lanes we have in our species. And we can calculate the vector loop size as how many iterations we're going to take to get through that loop given the size of the vector that we're using. And then what we can do is we can simply go through there, populate the vector using the from array um, <coughs> method, using the species to tell it what species is being used, the array that we're reading from, and the index to the current point in the array. And then we'll move that forward by the number of elements, populate again, and so on. Do the same for array B, and then do whatever we want to do with those vectors. Next thing that we can have is, is what's called a vector mask. And the reason behind this is that you may have a number of elements in your array which doesn't fit exactly into a multiple of the number of lanes that you've got. So as I've said here, you may have an array that's let's say has 30 elements in it, and given our 256-bit example, with eight lanes, 30 does not divide evenly by eight. What we end up with is the last iteration of our loop is only going to need six of those lanes, and the last two we don't need, because 24 is three times eight plus six gives us our 30. What we can do then is we can use the mask to suppress the operation on the lanes that we don't need in that particular operation. Now, for things like where you're just adding two to each element in each lane in that vector, it probably doesn't really make much difference. But if you're doing something like a reduction operation, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, it is very important to say we want to ignore those values because they're not taking any part in what we're actually doing. So you use a mask to suppress that, um, set it up, and then it will only use the ones which are selected from the lanes that we have in our vector. And I, I put here the definition. It says, you know, an operation suppressed by a mask will never cause an exception or side effect of any sort, even if the underlying scalar operation could potentially do so. So if you're doing something like a division um, and you've got zeros in your second vector, even though the operation division by zero would cause an error, an exception, that won't happen. It will be masked out. So in terms of using that mask, if we take the code that we saw before, we've got our loop where we're simply saying, OK, populate each vector as we loop through the number of times we need. If we want to apply a mask to that, we can create a mask based on the species that we have and the index in the range. So we're saying, we know how long the length of the array is. We know what the position in that array is. So how many elements are left? And if there's more than the number of lanes that we have in the vector, we populate all of those. But if there's less between the position of i and the length of the array, we'll create a mask that only selects those lanes and populate those and use those. And then we add that to the, the from array use the mask there, and that will then create the right um, values in our vector. We can also use a mask to form conditional execution. So we can actually say that we want to, to blend things together. We can say, right, we've got two different vectors. What we really want to do is select elements from the two vectors to create a combination of those two vectors. We'll, and to do that, we use the blend method. The easiest way to explain that is with a diagram. So let's say we've got two vectors, A and B, you can see there, um, different colors. 
If we provide a mask, what we can do is we can say if the value in the mask, the bit value in the mask is zero, what we're going to do is select the lane from the first vector, and if the mask bit is one, we'll select the lane from the second vector and create a new vector from that which builds up from the mask. So we've selected the two in the middle from the second vector and the two on the outside from the first vector. So it's just a way of combining two vectors using a bit mask and doing it in a simple, straightforward way. We can also shuffle vectors. If we want to reorder the elements that we have in the lanes, we can do that with an array. So here, what we're doing is saying, get our vector, int vector here, use the shuffle values, which are 0, 2, 4, 6, 1, 3, 5, 7, and then do a shuffle on that to generate a new um, version of A with the elements rearranged. Again, just to show that as a diagram to make it easier. What I've done is I've colored the elements here so that we've got um, the even numbered ones are purple, the odd numbered ones are green, and then that maps to what we've done in the, the uh, shuffle values. So what we're effectively doing is taking the purple ones, making those the first ones, and then taking the green ones, making those the thing. So we've reordered the lanes, the, the values in the lane, to generate a new set of values in the vector. Vector operations, what can we do once we've got our vector? So we can do the shuffling, we do the masking, all of that kind of thing. There's a large number of things you can do. Obviously, there's, um, we've broken them down into the type of operator. So you've got your associative operations where the order doesn't matter. You're adding, you're anding, you're oring, things like that. You've got binary operations where the order does matter. So two values where you want to divide one thing by another or raise something to a power. Obviously, the order does definitely matter if you're doing that. You can do comparisons. You can do equal, not equal, less than, greater than. You can also do conversions uh, between different types. So you can do double to byte. You can do byte to float, float to double, all sorts of things like that. There is one what's called ternary operator, which takes three values. And that's what's um, referred to as an FMA, a fused multiply and add. It seems that the, this is one thing that happens an awful lot when people are doing this kind of vector usage, is that you do a multiply followed by an add. I'm not quite sure why that happens, but it seems to be a very popular thing. So there's an FMA operation that does a fused multiply and add with three values. You've also got testing to see, is it finite, is it negative? And you've got unary operators for doing things like the logarithmic value, a negation, or a not of um, a value as well. Look at the vector operators for the full list. So if we want to use the, the mathematical operations, what we do is we create our two vectors in the way that we've done already, using our mask. So we've now got two vectors populated with values. And then what we can simply say is, right, tell the processor this is what we actually want to do with them. So we're going to say that we're going to multiply a by, so this is going to be a squared by, actually it's sort of a squared by, it should be, oh yes it is, a squared plus b squared, then square root. So calculating the, um, the Pythagoras type thing. But you can see there we've said VA multiplied by VA, add VB multiplied by VB, and then take the square root of all of that. So that's the simplicity of it, it's just chaining together the operations you want. Reduction operations, I mentioned this um, earlier when I talked about masking as well. So what you can do here is if you want to do something like a summation, you can say, right, rather than applying the same operation to each of the lanes and adding two to it or you know, uh, something like that, what you can do here is say, okay, take the values I've got in my lanes and add all of them together and create one value for that. And then you can obviously take that and generate some so you, you're adding up all the values in your um, array, but doing it using vectors to improve the efficiency of that. And in this case, we're, we're generating a, a value, um, sorry, an average. How well does it work? OK, so this is the important thing, right? So all this is, sounds really good. So we can use vectors. We can do all of this wonderful stuff. How good is it? Well, single instruction multiple data is fast because by virtue of the fact that we know we're getting true parallelism. We can do eight, we could do potentially 16 integer values, all at the same time, single clock cycle. It's got to be more efficient than doing it through simple iteration. But 
is always a but. Main memory access is relatively slow. So how quickly you can populate the vector becomes significant. So if you've got lots of data in your, you know, because um, obviously you've got L1 cache, L2 cache, L3 cache in your processor, those are relatively fast, because as you can see, somewhere, you know, from like three to five cycles, eight to 20 cycles, 50 to 80 cycles. But then once you start going out to RAM, so the bigger your array that you're processing, the more you're gonna have to go out to RAM to get the values to populate the vectors. So even though the vectors can be processed very quickly in parallel, if it takes a long time to get the values to put them in there, then you're going to lose the advantage of that parallelism. So the further you go away from the, the sort of L1 cache, the less of an improvement you're going to see in terms of using a SIMD instruction. The other thing to bear in mind is that the JIT compiler actually already knows about vectors. So it's like, that's great. So it already knows how to use vector operations. So a lot of the time, what you'll find is that you don't get any difference. Because even though you're telling the system how to use these vectors, the JIT compiler has already recognized in your code that it can use vector operations, and it will actually apply those and give you, better, you know, the same kind of results. The way to find out if it does make a difference is to turn off the what's called auto vectorization and tell the JIT compiler not to use the, the auto vectorization. So you turn off use super word um, and that will give you a, a clear picture of what the difference is between the two. So I've, I've got some results here which were produced by uh, Thomas Zeltzer and he's written a couple of really good articles. I, I very strongly recommend you read those um, on Medium. Um, so I give full credit to him for, for the results I'm actually going to show you now. So here what we're doing is, is simply taking two vectors and adding them together and looking at the difference in terms of performance. Now the blue line is using the JIT compiler where it's using auto vectorization. And that's giving us like the, the benchmark, so that's 100%. What we're then looking at is what's the difference if we use the vector API to explicitly state how we want to do this. And then what we're looking at along the bottom is the number of elements. So we've got 64, 512, 4K, 32K, 266K, 2 meg, 16 meg, 134 meg. So it goes across a very wide range of values. Now, what we see here is that for most of the time, the difference between what you get with the JIT compiler and what you get by using explicit vector code isn't that big. But there's a couple of things there. So like the one with 64 is much better with vector API and the one with 32K is, is not as good with the vector API. So you need to really kind of dig into the detail of that. And it turns out that the JIT compiler does some slightly funny things with 64 elements because it, it tries to make the assumption that actually it really doesn't need to use vector operations, and so it ends up being a bit slower. But in the case of 32K elements, it uses a different approach in terms of loop unrolling to the way that the vector operations happen. So it's doing not just uh, applying the vector operations, but also some other optimizations in that particular case. So it's, it's ending up with better results. Now, if you turn off auto vectorization, it does make it a bit more clear that vectorization is the way to go. And we'll see that obviously we've got much better results using the explicit vector API if we tell the JIT compiler not to use it. But again, what we see here is a, is a shape to the graph, which is where you can see that the fact that it, it goes on a downward slope is down to the fact that we're having to go further out to get the values to populate the vectors. And the time that it takes to do that is swamping the advantage of having the, um, the vector API available to us. If we do some other sort of comparisons, and I have to move on a bit here. Um, so here we're, we're introducing a conditional. So we're saying, OK, is this number less than? Is this number equal to? Is this number greater than a certain value? So we're introducing a conditional, and then count up how many times we've got things that are less than, equal to, or greater than. We see a very different graph. So this is with auto vectorization. So the JIT compiler is trying to use the vector operation. What's happening is that it's not giving us anywhere near as good performance as we do get if we're explicit about using the vector API. So this is a good example of when vector API wins over the JIT compiler. And so just to reiterate that, to, to make it more clear, if we take a simple piece of code here where we're, we're looking 
at um, two arrays, and we're adding the second element to the first element, but only if the, the, the um, second element is even, then we can also see how that affects the, the code that's generated. So if we look at hotspot, oh, I'm just running out of time. Um, if we look at hotspot, we'll see that it's, it's not using the vector API in that case, and it's only doing two elements per um, loop unrolling with two elements. If we look at Azul's JIT compiler, which is different, that does use the AVX2 instruction, so it is using vectorization, doing automatically. So the, the thing to, to understand there is that our JIT compiler is better because it does more auto vectorization in different situations. We can recognize more situations where it can be used. Just summarize, since I have run out of time, um, Vector API allows you explicit programming of single instruction multiple data. Um, simple situations, you won't really see much benefit from doing that. It's where you've got more complex situations, especially where you've got conditional branches, um, that we, you will see more benefit from that. Um, yeah. And the benefits you'll see will reduce the bigger the, the size of the, the arrays that you're actually, um, sit, actually processing. And like I said, ideally the comp compiler, the JIT compiler, will auto vectorize everything for you. So you shouldn't need this, but it's there if you do. And that's it. So thank you very much.